Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 131 of the American Muslim Experience. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. Assalamu alaikum, Parvez. I hope everybody is doing great. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, really excited about today's conversation. Uh, this has been a long time in the making, and we are uh, delighted to be joined by our guest. Um, and, you know, wanted to explore, I mean, so notwithstanding the fact that we've been wanting to do this conversation for a long time, um, one of the areas of interest that we have uh, touched on, but I don't think really have explored in depth, is female scholarship and female contribution to the Muslim intellectual tradition, the tradition in the Muslim world, but also very importantly here in the United States. And so I think today's guest is um, best suited to delve into some of these topics. And so Omar, um, please uh, do the honors and introduce our, our esteemed guest today. Yeah, we're delighted to have Muslima Permal. She is the co-founder of the, and religious director of the Majlis. A little background on her, uh, Muslima Perma was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. She was raised in San Diego, California. She graduated from the University of California at San Diego with a double major in religious studies and Middle Eastern studies. During these years, she served a number of different roles at her local MSA and at UCSD MS, and MSA West. Uh, after graduating, she left to study in Egypt, where she spent the better part of the next seven years. She completed the bachelor's program in Sharia from Al-Azhar University in Cairo, and also completed almost two years of graduate work at the American University in Cairo in Islamic Studies. She also attended the International Union of Muslim Scholars Future Scholars Program while she was studying in Cairo. Upon her return to America, uh, Muslima served the Southern California community in various capacities, including religious instruction, directing youth and young adult programs, university chaplaincy, and offering community pastoral care uh, at and with local masjids and organizations. She's taught classes and spoken nationally and internationally about issues related to Islamic law and ethics in a, an array of educational settings, including conferences, retreats, universities, libraries, and, and mosques. Currently, she serves as religious director at the Majlis, a community organization she and her husband, Jamal Diwan, co-founded together seeking to nurture safe community spaces where people can learn and live Islam based on the traditional sources of understanding the faith while acknowledging the particular challenges of the American context. She is the mother of two and resides with her family in Southern California. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Honored to be here. Alhamdulillah. And we're really glad to have you and, and yeah. learn a little about your background and your story and how you got to um, where you are today. So I, I, and before we do that, I just want to also kind of set the setting here. We're actually recording um, at uh, the South Bay Islamic Association uh, here in the Bay Area because we're not in Southern California, but we are actually, uh, Muslima is visiting us from so Southern California. So we're kind of playing makeshift host here, even though this isn't really, you know, this is just one of the massages that we have in the area. Uh, shout out to Uthar Siddiqui for helping setting all of this up for us. So thank you, uh, thank you, Uthar. Um, and um, yeah, and, and you're here because there's an ISNA conf a conference going on um, here in, uh, I guess, ISNA West mm -hmm. conference going on. So uh, anyway, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule while you're visiting here, traveling for another event uh, and also taking time to do this interview. So thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, alhamdulillah. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to say yes to, view, to Diffused Congruence is because your podcast was very instrumental in uh, my husband and I's journey. And as we were learning and as we were growing, some of the interviews you guys have done really did shape and change our lives. So oh, that's, happy to be here. Wow, subhanAllah. Thank you so much for saying that. It um, means a lot to us. Um, so, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, as we often do then as a listener, you can, um, you know, uh, we like to pick up on people's origin story. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, tell us about your background. Um, I guess being born and raised in Northern, I'm sorry, North Carolina, Carolina what that was like. And, and, and it's yeah. funny because Parvez and I were w uh, several months ago when <laughs> yeah, we were talking right. about and, and planning to have you on, uh, we well, were you and your husband. So yes, right, yes. Right, right, right. that's uh, yeah. yeah. Are you? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think I know where your story is going. No, but. we were just wondering, um, are you a convert? Are you? Because we had your husband heard the name. Yeah. We didn't know what, yeah. what the background was. Totally. And, and we're, and I had to, of course, ask you how to pronounce your name and inshallah, I got yeah. it right this time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, tell us a little about, I think there's your... something to be said about your name. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so my, I'm not a convert, <laughs> but my name is a different name yes. than what people have heard before. Um, my family, 
my parents, they are from Afghanistan and they migrated to America during the Soviet invasion. Mm. And they came as refugees uh, from Afghanistan and they came uh, in a difficult situation um, as many Afghans did during that time. The Afghan diaspora has started with the Soviet invasion and as we saw recently, it didn't end there. There's still, there's always a continuous wave of Afghans uh, leaving Afghanistan, which is really tragic. Um, but it's, at the same time, it is part of my story. Um, my parents, they had to escape in the middle of the night uh, and on very little notice. Uh, it was basically told to my dad that my different members of my family's name were on a hit list. And so they had to leave in the, they had to just pack their bags and go. And they had to do it very, very quickly because it was just a matter of time. Was, and, there, was there a reason why they, their name might have been on some list? Um, anyone who had any kind of prominence. So like my dad had just come back from getting his master's degree in, in America. He, I mean, even though he was from Afghanistan, he's one of the few people who actually got a scholarship to study in America, get his master's degree and go back. Oh. And he had um, a high position. It was something in, I, I think, in finance. In the, um, and then my uh, grandfather, uh, my mother's father, Allah Rahamu, he was a general in the army. And so, um, and then my uncle is also a general. And so it was just, it was a prominent family. It had, yeah. it had authority. It could sway people it could move people and so um certain people had become convinced of sort of like the communist agenda even from the afghans unfortunately um but some of them who had become convinced um they didn't want to see my family members die and so they uh they basically said we know your names are on a hit list and you should leave mm. and so um so yeah so my dad and my relatives from both sides of the family arranged to get out of the country. And for my immediate family, my parents, at that time my sister was born already and my older brother was born, they went through the Hindu Kush mountains and they crossed over into uh, Pakistan. And um, that was like a 12 day journey uh, on foot. Wow. And it's, um, you know, they, they, there's a lot to be said about that particular journey. But my mom, to this day, she says she learned so many of the lessons that she carries with her into life just from those 11 days. Wow. Um, and there was like a mujahid who led them through, like uh, the the mountains, because it was known that you can't you can't go through these territories unless you have a guide. Mm -hmm. And so um, their guide was this mujahid that they found out later on that he had actually died um, in, in fighting the Soviets. But he was someone who my mom, whenever she tells the story, she says, he had so much patience. <laughs> he mm. had so much patience. Um, they were wealthy in Afghanistan. So when they were traveling, they brought money. <laughs> That's what they thought to bring. But you don't have, money doesn't do anything for you in the middle of the mountains. Mm. Uh, you need food. Right. And so they, it was the first time that wealthy people experienced hunger and thirst. And they found um, the mountain people in Afghanistan that they were very poor compared to what they had come from, but would literally give them everything they had in their homes to feed them. And this was like very, very striking to my parents. Like my mom says, my mom talks about it. My dad talks about it. Um, there is uh, my mom and my dad. They said that these people that had literally almost nothing, they were just so happy. They were, they, and they, my mom recognized in them a happiness um, that the city people didn't have. And she was just wondering, like, how can you guys be so happy? You're in the mountains. You have, like, basic things here. You don't have, you know, I went to Kabul University as a woman in, in my time. Um, how are you living in the mountains so happy with the little that you have? And you want to give it to us. And my mom would say that. Um, they have so little, but they would cry when they would see them out of empathy for them, you know, like the, and they would, they would be like, oh, you guys are like Muhajideen, you know? And so um, they, like, they would give so generously out of like feeling sorry for them. And my mom, and this was, this really shook my mom because she was, because it made her feel like there's, there's a happiness that these people have that I haven't yet discovered. Right with all of the wealth and whatever background I have that, you know, these people have something else. And then my dad talks about a story about, um, there was a man who there was, uh, like the room that they had was a very, very small room. And he was just standing there to try to give them whatever it is they needed. And he wouldn't let them sleep somewhere else. Cause he was afraid that robbers would come by if they knew that there's people from the city in town. So he was like, no, you're going to sleep in my home. And then he sent his wife and kids somewhere else to sleep. And it was a very cold night, but basically he gave his own home to my, you know, my, my family. And, um, and then uh, he had 
like food made out of grain and oil. And um, after they ate the food to their fill, the man uh, told them, he said, you know, I had been saving like this much oil and like with my fingers, maybe like a couple mm-hmm. inches of oil. He's mm-hmm. like, I had, I had, I was been, I had been saving this much oil and grain for a special occasion, <laughs> you know? Wow. And um, I didn't know who it was meant for. And, um, and now I know that it was meant for you all. Like he was so happy. He was like, I, I, I was saving this for something and I finally got to use it. Mm-hmm. And um, this really, Really, and my dad said it was it would like break his heart because he wasn't allowed to give them money. You know, he, there was no way that he could thank them because if it got out, and this is what the mujahid told them, if it got out that that like city people are passing through with a lot of money, you're we're gonna get attacked on the road. Like there's gonna someone's gonna find out about it, and uh, you we're gonna get you're gonna meet highway robbers basically. Yeah. So, my dad's like I couldn't give him anything. As like, and he's like to this day it bothers me that I couldn't give him anything back. Yeah. So. Anyways, alhamdulillah, this was actually really instrumental for my parents because when they when they were in Af- they were in Pakistan for two weeks and they were in Germany for a year, and during that time they weren't allowed to work. So my, and my mom was pregnant with me, mm. and so um, and so she used that time to actually study Islam. So it was like the first time she was like, I want to study about what these people had because she really saw it was from their faith. Like it was it was an experience, tangible spiritual condition that these people had that they, that provided that kind of happiness and generosity so she started to like look into studying islam for herself like not just the practice that was known and passed down from her parents but like um how am i going to do this for myself and i want to learn it for myself so uh yeah, it, yeah. Would you, you know <laughs> I, would, I would just you know when when i hear you tell the story yeah. you're telling it and I am forgetting that you were born here. And you're telling it as if you, yeah, and, and what, what strikes it. me about that is yeah. these are this is like the story of your family in mm-hmm. like in America that will get passed on for a generation. It's like yeah. the, it really it literally is the origin yeah. story, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's, it's thank, you thank you for sharing that. Um, would you say like you know like your background like was your family maybe when they were living in the city were they just sort of like maybe more cultural Muslims? Uh, like then like really practicing i mean i don't know how the i don't know much about uh, you know a, um uh, afghan society to be able to talk i mean i can mm-hmm. certainly find corollary maybe from like india or pakistan but i'm just curious how that how that plays out and maybe if you even want to speak to your own family's background at least as they were when they were living in afghanistan so alhamdulillah, like in the yeah. sense of did they pray and did they fast yeah. and did they like practice the rituals and did they have certain concepts and did they learn about Islam in school? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it was kind of, um, I think it was just kind of like a default uh, when people are on autopilot. It's just, yeah. it's like the, and so it's practiced in the way that it, it's practiced there. Right. It's not necessarily like this very conscious, deliberate study and choice. And uh, my mom used to tell me that uh, people would tell her maybe she should wear hijab. And she would say, uh, her response was, I'll wear hijab when men start wearing hijab. <laughs> you know? Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they would say, well, wear it out of respect for your dad, for your father. And she was like, why would I wear it in front of my father? You know? Yeah. And um, <laughs> and uh, so the, another aspect of it is that there were certain rules that they just didn't understand where they came from. Okay. And so it wasn't, um, they didn't practice them simply because they just, they, they didn't really have a method to go about studying and understanding it. Um not, not at that time anyways. Uh, and so when they were, um, yeah, so when they were in Germany, that's when my mom tried to, t- uh, requested to find books. Like she's like, how do we find books? And so she found books that were written in Farsi and, um, tafsir of Quran especially. Um, and, uh, whatever she could read all day long, that's what she would do. Cause she couldn't work. Yeah. Um, and she was pregnant with me, so she was very sick. <laughs> was you very- know, like you mentioned autopilot, um, I'm sorry, like, I, yeah. yeah, I didn't mean to make light of, um, or have you, like, that's a terrible transition from when you were talking about your mom being sick, but I, I just couldn't help but reflect on, you know, oftentimes we use this word, like, or this expression of being culturally Muslim as almost a pejorative. Yeah. But I think, you know, when we think of society, traditional societies, especially in the Muslim world, or, you know, the, the diaspora, even beyond mm-hmm. just the quote unquote Muslim world, um, is that, you know, Islam is just, it's so, it's second nature. It's just, you know, you live it. And so there isn't, like you said, a conscious maybe effort to practice your faith um, because it's just ubiquitous in society or the culture is such that you can just be a Muslim. I'm sure you experienced that even in Cairo. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. where people are just, you know, they live their lives. 
but Islam is so, uh, you know, it, it's so subsumed within their cultural practice that, mm -hmm. uh, it, but it's not like, like you said, it's, it's almost like being on autopilot, but not, uh, but not in a negative way. Not in a yeah. negative way, right? Yeah, like generosity is a norm. There you go. Hospitality is a norm. That's what I'm saying. Um, Th that's a really good, yeah. uh, different it is. way to look at it. And, and and when you put it like that, I kind of yearn for the days oh. when we're all on autopilot, <laughs> right, right? right? Where we don't have to, it, it's not a, yeah. it's just more natural yeah. for all yeah, the Muslims yeah, to yeah. be able to easily practice. Yeah, and yeah. So that's right. maybe inshallah and, uh, will all, no, you know, and, <laughs> in and, a positive and they, way, and they, right? And they really did have that. Like I can tell from my parents' stories, um, from my from both sides of the family, that they really did have um, an appreciation for like different aspects of the religion that were that were just a regular part of life, mm -hmm. you right. know, so, um, as, you know, experienced. But in terms of maybe, I want to say maybe from like just being able to study it formally, they didn't right. necessarily have that. No, yeah. Um, but just like, it, but I mean, I want to say that some ideas, when it's not studied formally, it's possible for other ideas to become understood as part of religion right. when it's actually not part of religion. Mm -hmm. So that's why they would create some confusion. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Like this idea of wear a scarf in front of your father, right? That was- um, Out of respect. Out yeah. of respect. Yeah. Right, right, right. <clears throat> and so that would then confuse other concepts like the purpose of hijab in the first place. That's right. So- um, Or so, from a, even from a Shari perspective, it doesn't make sense yes. because you wouldn't cover in front of your father. Yes, but exactly. Normally. So yeah, I, I, that, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and but but I think that there's this uh, yeah I agree with you that sometimes when we say autopilot we yeah. mean we we mean it in a negative sense like as if you're not being mindful yeah or, you know yeah. it's just mindless and that's not the case it's just I want to say some things came to them because it was so widely practiced it's like I want to say it came to them very easily like it's a very natural and easy part of their religion yeah. because you're raised in it from from day one and that's oh, yeah. that's what I was saying in terms of yearning for the day when yeah, we're yeah. on yeah. like now. You have to, you kind of have to, not all things are easy in terms no, it, of practicing Islam, it's right? It's a in real America. conscious attempt. And, you know, like, and to quote someone in your neck of the woods, you know, Dr. Jackson talks a lot about this, this idea of like a siege mentality where mm -hmm. Muslims living as minorities and specifically here in the United States, there is that kind of heightened siege mentality where you're constantly you know, beleaguered and you're constantly having to struggle to assert your identity, to find your identity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go back home, you know, whatever home looks like, uh, whether it's Afghanistan or India or Pakistan or the, you know, the, like the so-called Muslim world, uh, those things are just natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's something that is really, I, I think like, you know, my wife and I just the other day, we were talking about, we we're contemplating a trip to Umrah, inshallah, and Egypt. Um, and, you know, one of the things we've talked about, or one of the things we were talking about for our kids' sake is they've never, first of all, they've never gone abroad. Mm -hmm. So this, this would be a first. Oh, and sure. secondly, it would be an abroad, it would be Umrah, and it would be like, you know, experiencing, you know, Egyptian society, Cairo, etc. And we were just talking about just them, picturing them just walking around a mar like a souk, a marketplace, mm -hmm. where everybody's Muslim, you're just sort of, it feels so natural is the way my mm -hmm. wife described it, just from her own experiences, um, visiting back home and visiting the Middle East, et cetera. Uh, and we were just talking about how that would be such a cultural shock for our kids mm -hmm. uh, who've been born and raised in America. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, kind of what we're talking yeah. about here, where it's always like you have to wear this like protective garment here in the United States, you know, in terms of your Islam. Whereas you go back home and it's so, maybe natural is the better mm -hmm. way to talk about I mean, it just simple than autopilot. accommodations that are yeah. just a natural part of society. Like you hear the adhan. And there you go. The mall has a musalla. There's a women's section. There's yeah. a wudu area. There's a, you yeah. know, there's all these different accommodations for just Muslim life that's just there in society because everyone's doing it together. Right. You don't even have to think about it. That's um, right. You don't think about where am I going to pray? No, you can go out and there's always going to be a place to pray. So, um, exactly. So it's, it's, and then also values wise, like really uh, ideas of anyone should be able to knock on your door and just come right in, in terms of have, being able to host guests at, at, at a, you know, at a moment's notice, they definitely were raised with that culture. That's right. Um, in terms of generosity and, and, and the guest was like a really big deal, uh, and is right. a really big deal in Afghan culture. So, um, but it's also part of the religion, but right. it's, you know, it's expressed in different ways. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you just to, and I, I mean, you know, and inshallah, we want to get to the United States uh, for your family's <laughs> sake, but um, is, is, you know, when people, especially those who are mis maybe don't know about or aren't as informed about um, Af Afghan society, um, we always hear about, or we always picture kind of a very tribal 
or mm -hmm. like tribe is important and it's a very tribal sort of culture. Would you say that's true? So there are tribes and there are languages that, yeah. I mean, like there's Pashto and there's Dari and um, there's just uh, different ethnicities within the greater Afghan, you know, uh, ethnicity, if I can use that term. Yeah. Um, there's the Pashtun, there's the Tajik, there's the Azara. And um, there were definitely inter-tribal, um, you could say, like, uh, discontent, but there mm. were also intertribal marriages and families okay. and things. So it was, both of them existed uh, simultaneously. Right. Um, at the time that my parents were there before, uh, I think the society was a lot less fractured. Okay. Uh, so I think it got worse post-war uh, than it was before in terms of the way they talk about uh, pe people married from all over. Like, um, And it was, I mean... There's this idea of the mountain people. You're not a lot, city men cannot marry for, or city people cannot marry from the mountain people, because the mountain people will die <laughs> when they come into the city. Literally, their lungs can't handle the air, and so they, the the brides get sick, and within a few months they pass away. Hmm. That's not that's not just like myth. No, that, no, that, that would happen. My, really? Like, and all by the way, most of these things, like, there's a folk, there's a there's a general right. thing of don't do this, and you're like, why? And they're like, well, uh, once upon a time, this actually happened, and I know, and like from how you deal with children <laughs> to like, <laughs> marriage, all these things all are rooted in like real stories that Got real it. people that they can cite for you right. can tell you the story of when this happened to someone. Mm. But um, but there's internally there's different even within city context itself there's yeah. different provinces and different provinces have subcultures. Uh, but they intermarry. Like mm. my my relatives are all intermarried with people from other subcultures um, within Afghanistan, and it's uh, they might be and and a single tribe can cover more than one sort mm. of sub okay. province. So the Pashtun, for example, can come from many different cities, right? Many different parts of Afghanistan. So, now a lot. Of, I know a lot of the languages are are sort of derived from Farsi, but 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 is Farsi sort of like high literary language? You know, in in. Uh, you know, Afghan culture. Well, it was the state religion, and so everyone knew it. And it state was state language. The, sorry, sorry, the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was no, the no. state religion. <laughs> it was the state language. Okay. Um, so it was the language that everyone knew. Right. Um, and whereas, like Pashto, the Pashtun knew, but people who were not Pashtun did not necessarily know it and couldn't speak it and couldn't speak it. But so, the Pashtun knew, would know Farsi. Usually. That's right. So yeah. Farsi then becomes the sort of lingua franca, if you will, or whatever yeah. word you want to use, where everybody could could sort of converse. And mm -hmm. speak, mm -hmm. um, and whereas because the tr the local languages and dialects were so different. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, similar corollary in India, although in India, like for example, not every Indian speaks Hindi. You know, so it, it, it's 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 because there. I don't know if Hindi is the official language. Probably is. I'm I'm being ignorant here, but um, you know, but that's not to assume that every single person is going to be able to speak Hindi. And so local languages then, you know, um become an issue in terms of being able to converse, mm -hmm. you know, when you travel across the country. So yeah. I can imagine something similar in, in, in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, just the, the fact that there is a national That's language right. helps. That's right. It so that alleviates can, that. Yeah. Alleviates yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then when you say, we, you, you, you um, accidentally said state religion, um, what, is sort of Sunni Islam sort of the normative? Uh, the normative kind yeah, of? it's the majority. And yeah. there are Shia. There are right. Shia Afghans as well. Um, they're a minority. And unfortunately, they've been a persecuted minority yeah. um, within Afghanistan. Not, uh, I want to say it's been, but it's usually tribal persecution. Mm. You know, is it uh, Dari? That's well, Dari is just a, the, a, a form of the Farsi language. Uh, okay, yeah. but I'm saying the 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 the, uh, the Shia mi minority. Mm -hmm. Do they belong to a like? Do they generally speak a particular language? Or so they anything? have their their tribal group is the Hazara. Usually. That's what. I, okay, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Yeah, that's right, and so. Um, and they're, but it's all over Afghanistan. Like they're found all over. It's not just a particular I think they're, area. Yeah, they're, but, I, but I imagine they're in, um, there's probably areas where they're, they're more of them than okay. other areas. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not like a really, I'm not <laughs> much of a specialist because in Afghanistan because I was born here. Yeah. But, um, but these are just things I've heard yeah. and learned from, you yeah. know, my family. Well, let's let's talk now about your your experience in the in the U.S. and growing up. Right. Um, so they finally make it after Germany. They yeah. they come straight to the United States. Yes. And do they settle in North Carolina? They settled in North Carolina. Is that where your father went to school? What no, was my North father Carolina? went to school in Pennsylvania. Uh huh. But uh, North Carolina was supposed to be a stopping grounds on the way to California. 
Really? And then okay. uh, they ended up just stopping <laughs> instead of a stopping ground. California because maybe some relatives or what have you here? I, I think everyone had heard that California was the place to go in America. Mm. And also I think, um, you know, thing, like the, if you look at California, how much of California is Afghan, right? Like you have Fremont to I was stand. just about to say. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so people knew that it was the largest, arguably. But like Afghans the, are coming yeah. here. Afghans right. are settling. And, and you're talking about mid, mid, early, mid 80s right now? Well, uh, so I'm going to date myself. <laughs> I was just about to say, however gingerly you want to approach that, because you will date yourself. Yeah, that, that was my ginger, ginger <laughs> pre- way to ask. I it, just want to say early eighties. Okay. okay, there you go. Uh, um, and so by that time, uh, California had already uh, was housing a large uh, Afghan, um, Afghani uh, diaspora. I don't know if it was large because I know that okay. my parents were from the first that were able to get out. That's true. Yeah. Um, so. But just that it was a place that was known as a right. place to go. Got it. Um, but they ended up stopping in North Carolina. I was born. Um, I was when when I was when I was born on the day of Eid. Apparently, <laughs> mm-hmm. like my daughter as well. <laughs> yeah, my daughter right. was born on Eid. Second September. daughter. It's yeah. Eid al-Fitr. We yeah. have the same birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my mom chose the name Muslima because. I think it was a reflection of her own spiritual journey mm. that like she was finally choosing Islam like right. for her like it's it's not that she had never not chosen it but through the 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 journey to America and through studying the religion and um she wanted to like basically not a born again muslim but kind of like choose it commit, for herself commit yeah to like the really in, in a very intentional way and so um yeah so it wasn't a name that uh it I think it just reflected something that she was actually herself going through. And even your last name, it, I mean, it, it's obviously your family name, but mm-hmm. it is kind of unique. So yeah, it's named after like some rivers, apparently. Um, and this is rivers, like there's two rivers, apparently. one of them is called Ormul and the other one is called Purmul. Mm-hmm. So it's the rivers of Ormul and Purmul, which apparently like that's where my dad's side of the family originated from around there. Oh, okay. And sometimes it's like, it's they say it's Furmul, but the Pashto pronunciation is Purmul. So you might find someone with the last name Formal or formally, and they'll be related. <laughs> related, and is that why? Is is it because Pashto doesn't have like the fa? Sound? It's just the pronunciation. Oh, of the, the pronunciation fa. Yeah. Okay, of the fa. Yeah. Really, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Um. So sorry, and and, and so rally. Obviously, and when I think of rally, I think of the research triangle. I think of academia. I mean, is that your father? Like, sort of his was he an academic? No, his background is um, accounting, mm. and. Uh, that's why he was in the Ministry of Finance in Afghanistan. Oh, right. You and then uh, my mom, she graduated from the University of Kabul in chemistry. Um, and so she was a chemist when she came. Uh, and she, I think um, she was the first in her family to actually wear a hijab, you know. Uh, and again, it was like she was the one that when she wore it, everyone said, we never thought of all the people to wear it that you would be the one to wear it because she said that she was very fashionable and she always had the latest trends and the the the, the what if something was popular um in 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 the west she would be the first of her friends to have mm. it like in afghanistan like she mm. would know she would keep up on all that and so no one believed that she would be the first one to wear hijab but uh, and a lot of people discouraged her yeah so i guess um how were those early years in rally i mean i mean i'm generally curious um you, you were talking about the diaspora a little bit was there a pretty substantial community um not just a, a, afghan community but just in general in rally at the time yeah so uh there was the islamic association of raleigh okay and that is actually the same community that the Chapel Hill uh, shooting that the, their family came from. Yeah. And so it's, um, you know, it's an interesting reality because that hit me af- after we moved to California. But um, in Raleigh, it's it was a smaller masjid and then they built a bigger masjid and like a gymnasium and, and the old masjid became the school. And I was there before. Uh, that transition happened. Okay, but it was a very diverse community. That was one of the things I loved the most about the masjid growing up as a kid was every single ethnicity, and um, youth group leaders and uh, from everywhere. Like, and and I like new converts, people who have been Muslim their whole lives, but from other contexts. You know, not from like necessarily the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, so it was just uh, I grew up where the diversity in the masjid was a norm. I think it was early. Islam was early enough in America where people hadn't split off into smaller, yeah. um, ethnically based masajid. So yeah. I literally had my my friends in the masjid were from every single country I could imagine. Yeah, and and, and, and we we've, we've been talking about that a lot as well. And it's not just 
um, ethnically diverse. It's mm-hmm. socioeconomically diverse yes. as well. And, and I mean, I can relate to that same experience. Mm-hmm. It really creates a feeling of like one ummah mm-hmm. when you go to the masjid and and you see all this diversity. Again, not just racial, mm-hmm. but everything. Um, mm-hmm. And it creates a feeling of just connectedness with all these people who are on the on paper very different than mm-hmm. you, right? And I, to me, it was a very it was a very um, like iman iman or identity Muslim identity strengthening experience. I'm sure it sounds yeah. like the same for you. Yeah. yeah, it was actually from the beautiful uh, experiences at the masjid uh, with with women who came from different backgrounds. There were white American Muslim women, there were African American Muslim women, uh, and they ran a lot of the different programs that were happening for the kids. Uh, there were also women from the Middle East, but the the way that you know just the setup was, it was very it was a very loving environment. And uh, I, I actually wore hijab early as a in my life simply out of the inspiration of the being at the mosque around mm. beautiful women. Like these were these were women who had such beautiful conduct. And, uh, you know, like you're around people like that, you want to be like them, you know? So it, it didn't have the connotations that we hear about sometimes from sisters who are, maybe they associate hijab with harsh treatment or they associate, associate hijab with someone who was mean to them at the mosque. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had the opposite, like hijab meant uh, people who are really, really kind to me. And uh, my my, I remember there was this lady in the youth group. She uh, she herself came from a lower socioeconomic background, and she was a white Muslim. And she, uh, it, this was also a time when everything was free sabila. So if somebody was doing anything in the mosque, they were paying for it, you know. And yeah. so this was someone whose back economic background was not. She's not rich at all, and I didn't really realize that until um, one day it was like I saw her sitting in the parking lot. And everyone else had, they had proper lunches. And I saw what she was eating is what looked to me like grass, <laughs> but it wasn't grass, it was just alfalfa sprouts. Yeah. Um, and she was just putting that in a piece of bread and that was going to be like her meal. And I knew that the rest of the day was like a long day, but that was her break. And I realized all the art supplies she buys, everything that she's doing for the kids, like she's putting us first and, mm. then, and then taking care of herself. Wow. So I, I, that was like a... Um, like you see that with your eyes in terms of people who serve because they love to serve. Uh, it's very actually in some ways it's very similar to the man in Afghanistan who gave the food right. <laughs> to my family. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, kind of full circle. Um, so you got to experience that. Um, now you were um, how old when you your family moves out west? Then I guess completes the journey yeah. as it were that they began. Right um, when they came. Finally here. got to California <laughs> uh, when I was uh, ten years old. We moved okay. to we moved to okay. California when I was ten. Uh, and that was again um, when you were staying in Raleigh, at, or R- I think Raleigh is probably the correct pronunciation. I was going to say Perez. You're uh, <laughs> I've been R- saying Raleigh. Raleigh I know, yeah. and and you and you said Raleigh. So, um, uh, was it like like meant to be kind of a pit stop, or you didn't know at the time? It was sort of uncertain, you know, or your as family. A ki- as a kid growing yeah. up, I thought we were going to be in Raleigh forever. <laughs> that right. was home. That was home. Yeah. yeah. That was home. So right. moving to California was a big uprooting. I had to leave all my best friends. I had to leave my right. cousins and aunts and uncles and everyone. Um, and there was a certain amount of my family that came with us to California. Okay. Like some aunts and uncles, cousins came, but the vast majority stayed uh, stayed in, in, in North Carolina. And what was the difference in the Muslim community from uh, the one you left, which mm-hmm. you've described as really a beautiful thing, to mm-hmm. the one you came to? And the one you came to specifically was San Diego? Was San Diego. Okay. 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 So uh, a few things, um, at least in terms of the wider society, uh, which is like just being out in public as a Muslim, there was like no staring. There was no one cared <laughs> that I was Muslim. There or here? Here, here oh, in California. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I remember being really surprised by that because yeah. I, I wore the hijab early. I wore it like when I was in third grade because I wanted to do extra credit. Hmm. And, um, but it was also like just, I was really inspired by the women at the masjid. And so the uh, when I came out here, over there, like people would be staring at me and my family. Anytime we went anywhere, the staring is was so like you got so used to the staring. Wow. It was an expectation. Yeah. So you're going in, you're like, I have entered. <laughs> you, may, you may now stare. <laughs> you, know? Whoa, North you may now stop the... your eating at the restaurant and just yeah. stare at me. Yeah. North you may Carolina not, you know? is the South. Yeah. Right? It's oh, the South. It's, it's the, the South. South. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. yeah. And then coming to California and walking into a grocery store with my family and no one caring, no one stared, no one looked, no one flinched. And I'm like, hello, everyone. <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> no one cared. Right. I was like, wow. It's, it's, it was a different kind of invisibility that I appreciated. Like, right. I, this was like, uh, I'm just here and it's okay for me to just be here the way I am. Yeah. Uh, so that I really love that about California a lot. I do too. And I hope yeah. that spirit remains, you know, in spite of 
I mean, like what's happening out there. I, I mean, mean, exactly. Um, you know, in terms of politics and so on. And I, I don't, I haven't, I mean, obviously just only visited Southern California. It tends to be a little bit more conservative than we're used yeah. to in here the in the Bay yeah. Area specifically. But uh, it's, it's good to hear that that spirit is alive and well sort of yeah. all over, you know, so. Um, now, you're, are you public school? Or are you like what's I'm the... only in public school at this okay. time, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I was, uh, I went to like in terms of the difference between the Muslim community yeah. it was kind of like the opposite in the sense that in Raleigh the the masjid was diverse and people were really one. It was really one community. Yeah. There wasn't small pockets of different communities. And in San Diego, I, I I it felt like Islam had been here institutionally longer. I was just about to ask. And so it was there long enough for people to form ethnic masjids. Right. So that's the African-American masjid and this is the Afghan masjid. And Egyptians do their picnics on this day and Algerians mm. do their picnics on that day. Mm. And um, and I ha I had never experienced that in North Carolina. It was more. Uh, it was just if there was a community wide event, it was for everyone. Um, and then, uh, you know, that sort of like seeing those uh, uh, clicks inside the yeah, masjid, right. uh, growing up, uh, witnessing that, and just feeling that that's different. And uh, it was just persistence. We continued to come to the masjid. We continued to try to be a part of everything. And I think it helped to um, break down some of those. Yeah. No, Some of those uh, boundaries, I should say. You said institutionalized. I mean, was it generally speaking an older, and I don't mean by age, I mean by, you know, mm -hmm. there was an older community in San Diego? Because I know like LA and um, um, Orange County had yes. had long standing communities. Same thing with San Diego? Same with San Diego. Actually, the very first mosque in California is in San Diego. Really? And it's a nation of, it was a nation of Islam temple oh, okay. uh, that became. Uh, a masjid under Waratin Muhammad's community. Right. So yeah. that's still there. But it's the, actually the first mosque in California is in wow, San Diego. Oh, I did not know that. And uh, it's actually considered a historical landmark, mm. that particular masjid, masjid Taqwa. It's called okay, Masjid right. Taqwa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. <laughs> so I'd love to um, kind of transition to your interest in actual Islamic scholarship. And yeah. because that, that you go to UCSD, that's San Diego for you non Californians, uh, <laughs> and you study religious studies, Middle Eastern studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you um, knew you wanted to do from uh, high, high school age? Or how did you kind of mm -hmm. step Grab into it. that door of scholarship? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I, 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 when I was in seventh grade, our English teacher made us write an essay on what we wanted to do when we got older, when we grew, when we grow up. And uh, I thought about it and what I really wanted to do, but I hadn't really seen it uh, formulated in any position or job, was I just wanted to study Islam. Hmm. And when I, and like there are no employed positions at this time for Muslim women who've studied Islam that I knew of anyways in my age. And so I thought about it and said, you know, I'd, I'd like to be a professor in, this, in uh, Islamic history. That's what I had actually written because I'm like, that's the, probably the only way I can get formally study Islam and, you know, have it as a job too. And, and even that, there mm -hmm. is no precedence. Like you didn't, did you have anybody that you were looking yeah, at? Good question. No, yeah. no. It was just like, how do you have a job where right. you get to study Islam? Okay. And so that's what I came up with. And then um, later on when I was in ninth grade, I was in my world history class and I, you know, I saw this video of, uh, on, on world religions and in the video, there was a feature on the Muslim world and uh, Egypt in particular, and how the oldest standing universities in Egypt, and they showed the masjid, Masjid al-Azhar, and they showed the scholars. And something about that video just really struck me to my core. Mm. And I was I, I was only in ninth grade, but I saw the 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 scene of the oldest standing university that's still there that's that's been teaching Islam for centuries. And I just prayed. I was like, Oh Allah, let me go to Azhar one day. <laughs> so I make that dua and. I kind of forget about it. Like I, I make, mm. I remember making it very distinctly because I was, I remember being so moved by the video, and that was my first introduction to Al Asad was world history class ninth grade. Wow. And uh, you know, ten years later, if you want to fast forward, this is after I've gone to college, after I've met my husband and married my husband. Um, you know, after we've uh, studied abroad in Egypt and learned Arabic, and after we've uh, gotten the scholarship to go and study in Al-Azhar. <laughs> we're, we're, we're back in the States, right before we're about to go overseas. And um, I, my younger brothers are not going to the same high school. <laughs> and they invite me to uh, come and talk to their MSA. So I come onto the campus and I'm walking and I was like, you know what, let me just go walk past some of my old classrooms. So I just take a different route and I walk past my old world, world, world history classroom. And as I'm passing by, 
the same teacher is still sitting at the desk. It's like during lunchtime, there's no one in the class. And it's structured the exact same way. And I see my old chair and I see the TV screen in the corner. It's yeah. still there too. And I remember the dua that I had made when I was in ninth grade. Mm. And it's like Allah had brought me back to that exact same spot to be like, you know, that dua was answered. Right. It was, it was, it was a very. <laughs> you hadn't, you hadn't thought about that dua when you like showed up at Azhar, for example, the first day. Like, well, I mean, I hadn't yet gone. I hadn't like so. This is literally the summer oh, before we're sorry. going to right, go study. Right, right. You yeah. said the scholarship. And so everything. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to study That's Islam, fair. right? And I, right. I ideally it was going to be Islam, but I never really remembered like where right. it came from. You know, like right. like how how thoughts and sort of um, your interests progress. That first moment, you kind of forget. After, yeah. You know, after yeah. that, just, I just want to study Islam wherever it's going to take me, and it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily have to be Islam. Although I, I, I was just, it, I remember it being like ideally for some reason that like that was the institution I wanted to do. And um, without prior sort of knowledge mm -hmm. of even what that would entail. And then like when I was in college, I did religious studies and Middle Eastern studies because that was the only Western thing that mm -hmm. I could do that was going to be a study of Islam that could be closest to the study of Islam. Right. And alhamdulillah, I, I met my husband there and it was part of our marriage contract for him to uh, actually take me overseas to study Arabic and Islamic studies. So and was, and, well, and wanna... Sarbe, yeah, just like we were, were blessed to have Sheikha Muslima Today, I think uh, there's there's a, a separate kind of parallel chapter with uh, with Sheikh Jamal, right? Oh and, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, yeah, we won't, probably sure. won't have a chance to get into it today, but that's the tease for another podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, it is definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. We had contemplated doing this together or doing it separately. It just worked out that it was going to be separate. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, definitely, we'll, we'll uh, milk two episodes out of it rather than just one. Um, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> now, I wanted to pause you pause on a couple of things because I think you fascinating a couple of things. One, just for the, I think, the benefit of, of us sitting here, but also our listeners, um, you know, dua, like making supplication to Allah, like, and then having that, you know, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You said in your own, that, that, that little anecdote that you shared, a period of what, 10 years to fast? Yeah, it was, t it was 10 years from the time I had Right, 10 years. Yeah. So I think just a poignant reminder about that, you know, like to have patience, right, yeah. with, with regards to, to when, when we do supplicate, and mm -hmm. oftentimes... You know, when when we don't have immediate sort of you know uh, instant gratification from God, you know we we it it, it troubles us mm -hmm. and it's troubling. And I think that's just a really poignant reminder about how um, you know yeah. you yeah. have to have patience, and 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 God will either deliver to you what you ask, or you know there be are better things. Better than what you ask. That's right. There are things happening in the other realm that we aren't even aware of in terms of that the the the. the Ijab of that dua, like mm -hmm. the mustajab, you know, the, that dua being acceptable. So I just find that a really beautiful, poignant yeah. reminder. Yeah, the and other thing. I have another point, but yeah, we'll come we'll back. Come back. I just want to, yeah. related to that, you know, it reminds me how it, it sounds like you made a dua from the heart mm -hmm. that was very just like how you felt deep down. You weren't even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think there's a sincerity in those duas that you're not, you're not really thinking, you're just kind of feeling and it's coming from really deep internally. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, so that's just the thought that came came to mind. That's why maybe you forgot about it because yeah. it wasn't in your head; it was in your heart. Mm, Subhanallah. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even think of that. I was what what came to my mind about it was like in ninth grade, you don't have a driver's license, you don't have the <laughs> you know you don't have a bank account, yeah. you don't have anything. You're looking at something that's a that's like you can't even begin to ask your parents, "Can I go to another country <laughs> and go do this?" You know, this is not even a time when people yeah. are spend, sending their kids overseas, yeah. and um, and it's just like. You know, for anyone who has a hope or a dream, you know, like you don't need anything to make dot to Allah. He's the That's owner right. of everything and, he, right. and he can facilitate it, you know, in a way that you couldn't even imagine. So, no, it's another, again, kind of a very poignant lesson about, you know, praying to God, which is, um, you know, uh, aim, you know, pray aim big, high. aim yeah. high. That's right. <laughs> I mean, like you said, Allah is. Allah can grant anything. And so outside of the realm of possibility, as it seemed to a young ninth grader, here you go. Yeah. You know, that's again a beautiful reminder. Um, I want to come like I, you mentioned about the nikah contract. I think that's another, again, poignant. You know, something to pause on. I don't know if you want to talk about it now or maybe actually. Yeah, I think now would be a good time to talk about it. Um, you know, like where people forget that like you can stipulate things in the contract mm -hmm. mutually. Yeah, and it, it's sort of like an obligation on on the partner to provide that. Yeah, and so. while we're not going to go into the entire story, I do want maybe for our listeners, we just need to provide some context about 
uh, who your husband is. So uh-huh. if you wanted to... Just, oh, we named him in the intro, but yeah. yeah just a little more point. context for, for folks who may not know um, yeah. who he is or mm-hmm. what his background is. Sure. His name is Jamal Diwan, mm-hmm. and he actually converted to Islam in college. He became Muslim after 9-11, and uh, his mom is from Newfoundland, Canada, and his father is from uh, Pakistan, like Memon background. But they, he was not raised with any religion. He was raised in uh, L.A., Torrance area. He grew up playing basketball, listening to hip-hop. <laughs> and um, I first met him in my college MSA. And when he was at the MSA, he was already Muslim. So the first time I see him, he's okay. already taken the Shahada. Right. Everyone always asks, did you? No, no, no. He did not convert <laughs> yeah. for me. He became Muslim <laughs> before me. <laughs> and I, I first saw him at the MSA, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so uh, th- thank you for that. Um, so th- the idea of like, yeah, like, you know, demanding or stipulating things in a contract, I mean, I think that's really important and something that's unfortunately not become sort of practiced across cultures. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a really important reminder, I mean, for our yeah. listeners that you can do that. I mean, I, I think that some of these issues become reasons for people not to marry, right? Mm. So people will say, finish, get your PhD first, then get married, right. or uh, get become a doctor first, then get married, or do this, or do a bunch of these things first and get and then get married, because they're so afraid that if you have, if you get married and if you have children, then, um, then somehow all of your plans will fall apart. And that there's a valid fear in that, but you can also put it in the contract. So it's like, not only is it a mutual decision, but it's like both families are that are coming together, both wider families are coming together. Realize like this is a this is a focal point that we want to make sure, um, right. you know, to protect uh, in, within the marriage itself. And and from a jurisprudence point of view, I mean, it, it, it's it's binding. Yes. If you put something in if the contract, if you put stipulations yeah. like yeah. that in the contract, yeah. they are binding. Thank absolutely. you, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so now let's um, yeah, you know, <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> shadowy stipulations <laughs> and binding nature of them. Um, let's get us to yes, he is indentured <laughs> servitude. <laughs> let's get us to uh, I guess Cairo. So I mean, get you know, so you and and Jamal both are able to get a scholarship to That's go right. and study. Yes, uh, was that kind of a make or break kind of thing for you? Like either you were had to get that scholarship and go, yeah, or you know, you could have facilitated some other means, you know, to be able to get there. How does that work? Yeah. Well, for, we basically, we literally, yeah. and again, like the earlier lesson was about dot. This one is about just making intention, which <laughs> was, oh, Allah, if, if, if Allah opens the door to this good for us to do it, then we will take it. Mm. If, like we want this, we don't know how we're going to get it, but if Allah opens it for us, we will walk through that door, you know? So, um, so, and, and seeking to see if there's, if there's a way. So after, um, while my husband was still doing his, uh, undergraduate degree at UCSD, uh, my father-in-law made a, because he knew that we wanted to learn Arabic. My father-in-law uh, said to him that if you just add a science major, I will fund your study of Arabic, <laughs> you and your wife to go study Arabic. But because he really wanted my husband to have something in the sciences in his, like something, even a minor. So my husband is a third world studies major. <laughs> and so he added psychology, which, 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 which was sufficient. You Technically, know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in the Suffices. Sufficient so, yeah. for the Pakistani <laughs> mammoth father-in-law. Yeah. I love that. That's great. So yeah. our first scholarship is actually from my father-in-law. May Allah bless him and put all the reward in his mizan. I mean, and he um so they they funded us for to go and do the Diwan Center intensive for nine ten months actually yeah. and um, but then we came back to the states and we didn't know how we're going to get back to Egypt. So and the fact that you chose the Diwan Center had no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no deeper connection, right? No, no, yeah, d- d- yeah. yeah. Diwan is a, is an Arabic word, but it's yeah. a um, the this was, it just happened to be the name of the center that we ended yeah. up studying at. Mashallah. No, I just I mean that that again, right? There's 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 ayat, there's signs because I mean there's so many. Uh, I imagine even when you went. Um, you know, I mean, I happen to be at Sibawe, but there was like so many. Al Fajr, I think, had a, had a language institute. There was so you know, many. You know, D1 and Sibawe are kind of like the bloods and the crips, right? Really? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> that would have been so funny. <laughs> I totally believed it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but well, there is an interesting history there. I won't go into it on this podcast, sure, but fair maybe enough. another day. Fair another enough. Time. Wow. Now you've teased something that I'm really interested in. Um, of course, my studies were very, very short compared to yours, but um, nonetheless, uh, the Arabic study was really critical. Um, so, um, so, so, in shot, so, alhamdulillah, you get the scholarship. Well, at least you have a patron in your father in law at the time, mm-hmm. and you're able to go and at least commit to Arabic studies. Yes. Um, how long of a of a commitment is that initially, at least? 
For us, it was uh, the the program at D1 Center was nine months. We stayed yeah. for ten, okay. and we did their intensive, and we did some Quran as well, and like, mm. uh, um, you know, that was that was what we could do at that time. Yeah. Uh, when we came, but there was it was like it was five hours a day minimum in class, and and three to five hours of homework at you know after class. So yeah. it was when I say intensive, it's in, like we. At some point, I was told my husband, I'm like, I'm feeling like I'm losing my iman. And he's like, why? I was like, because I'm reading about John and Steve every day. <laughs> you know, like, right. it's like, it's, I'm, not, I'm not reading, like, religious books That's yet. Right. You know, or Maha and Kareem or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. so I they're at the John and Steve are at the beach and <laughs> the different context than today, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, right, right. But still, it was just very, like, uh, technical. That's and right. so I was like, this is, you know, I remember feeling a little bit confused because I'm like, this feels like it's hurting my faith because it's not, I'm not doing the religious studies. I'm spending like 10 hours a day. Mm. Um, but alhamdulillah, once we started to do tajweed and Quran, then, then that really alleviated some of that. And then... Um, there was a time where all these like institutes were up in like Madinat Nasr or yeah, something? Is that where, where, where you're living? Okay, yeah. okay. And Which then is, there was a where is that? Just sorry, for... Madinat Nasr is like a suburb of Cairo, you could say, okay. like an area of Cairo. Uh, Nasser City uh, in, ah, in okay. anglicized, but it's Madinat Nasser was where it was. I was lucky because uh, at least Sibawe, um allowed for some of the tutors to come to you. Mm -hmm. So even though I was all the way in Zamalek, um, again mm -hmm. we're talking geography of Cairo, but yeah. uh, I, I just I can't help but reminisce. I love I love Cairo. I love my time there. So, um, but yeah, so he would come to me, and it was it, was, it saved a lot of. Well, like, Zamalek's a beautiful part of Cairo. It so. really is. So, uh, which is a little. Jazeera, Gazira, as they would say. Um, anyway, sorry, a little island. Um, so the um, um, the peninsula, technically not island. Sorry. Uh, so so you were there for nine, ten months, and then what was the plan after that? And did you like how far? You said once the tajweed and, and the Quranic, uh, the tilawa like kicked in, like in terms of being able to commit to that. Um, what was the plan then from that point for both of you? So we came back and... Well, we'll let Jamal tell his story, but like for <laughs> yeah. you, yeah, just your story right now. So what was your plan? Oh, uh, we didn't really have one other than to come back to America and, and work until we figured out a way to go back overseas. So, <laughs> Got um, it. So like literally I started subbing at the Islamic school mm -hmm. and my husband uh, initially was working at a pizza shop. Muslim pizza shop until he started working for an insurance company. Uh, yeah. And like, uh, what is it called? Um, customer service. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, yeah. 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 Not telemarketer, but customer service. Yeah, yeah customer for, support. Yeah, yeah customer, customer support, support for like an insurance company. Um, and it was just like work. And, but how do we get back? Yeah. And uh, then at that time, there was this other organization in Michigan called uh, Islamic American University. Oh, yeah. And uh, they wanted to send people overseas to study. And the person who actually told us about it was Sheikh Taha Hassan from at the, the imam at ICSD. So our local imam, he knew how much okay. we wanted to go back. And actually, he told us, like, even though he didn't want us to go back, he wanted to stay in San Diego <laughs> and help and volunteer and, you know, do, be part of the community building of San Diego. He um, contacted IAU for us, and he told them he, about me and my husband, and we, like, sent applications, and, and then the, yeah. the person from IAU came in to, to San Diego and interviewed us and um, basically agreed to give us the scholarship to go study abroad. So, alhamdulillah. That was through you know, Sheikh Taha. So, may all of that reward also be in the Mizan of Sheikh Taha. Amen. Um, and so you're, so, you're able to go. And um, so, I guess, tell us, well, for one, um, what what were your early experiences, like, what were your experiences thus far in Cairo? Because I know, you know, again, I, I can't, you know, speak anecdotally, anecdotally of myself, but I remember hearing experiences from other people, certainly mm -hmm. female students yeah. who are abroad, yeah. that, you know, it can be a little sketchy sometimes, or it can be a little dodgy for, 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 for young women. And of yeah. course, you're married, so your husband is there, but could you maybe talk a little bit about that? I mean, if you're comfortable sharing, like in terms of what those experiences are like, has it changed? Has it improved? Mm -hmm. Is it roughly the same? Has it gotten worse? Yeah. So interestingly, like we were there when... Uh, up until basically the Arab Spring. Okay. And we left after Morsi was elected. Like that's when our last exams happened and we finished and then we came back to America. He was elected. We thought Egypt got free elections. We mm. ended on a good note. <laughs> All is well. <laughs> and that's, and that, that, that event was the um, also timed with the completion of your seven uh, years? Of, of our, yes. Of what Which, as planned. Yes. Okay. Um, and so wow. the, so the, but what that means is that we saw the country as it was under the pressure that it was under that led to the Arab Spring in the first place. That's right. So, so each year we'd come to America. I mean, we'd, we'd go to Egypt and then in the summertime we'd come back and then we'd come back from America to, to start the school year again. 
and we'd feel like it, it's gotten harder on people. Like every, we were like, it's not just because we were in America for a few months. It's like nowhere we can feel the pressure increasing in different ways, economic, um, social, definitely political. Uh, and one of the sort of consequences sometimes I think of that kind of social, economic, political pressure is um, uh, different kinds of crime. Mm. You know, and one of the where that really played out, I think, for unfortunately for a lot of sisters who were studying abroad is we were there during the height of basically the sexual harassment era in Egypt, if you can call it that. Really? So um, so sisters that were studying, they were, they were told, like, stay in groups, carry pepper spray. And there was actually incidents, unfortunate incidents that were reported of things happening to sisters when they were trying to walk to class. So don't walk by yourself um, and different kinds of basically... I mean, there's no other term for it other than sexual harassment. So, mm -hmm. so on one hand, you have that happening. On the other hand, there was also, I think, a rise of, I don't want to call it misogynistic, but just some of the rhetoric that's, been, that's being put out in the name of religion. And this is not necessarily, not from Al-Azhar as an institution, but just from ran, like the, khut, the, lo, the local neighborhood khutbah, right? Um, there was like a seven-part series on the, like, Naqab being mandatory mm -hmm. <laughs> in Jummah. So seven Jummah khutbahs about this topic. Mm -hmm. Seven yeah. Jummahs in a row? In a row. Wow. Yeah. What did they talk about in the night of the 27th? That's persistence on, on the part of that speaker. <laughs> yeah. And like, what did they talk about in the night of the 27th in the masjid that was closest to where I lived? M night of the 27th of Ramadan. Right. Pack is night in the, in the masjid. How the, the hijab actually means naqab. And there was like, you know, these posters in the streets of like incorrect and correct hijab. And there were people saying, oh, the, all the sexual harassment wouldn't happen if people just covered themselves properly. There you go. And so there was like this very palpable um, just mistreatment. Yeah. Uh, and I would then, say, like yeah. you said, misogyny. I mean, I think maybe like a kind of paternalism yeah. that, that that creeps into society, especially in the name of like, oh, we're, this is just to safeguard our, our sisters. <laughs> yeah. This is just to protect our sisters. But it's so paternalistic, yeah. right? And, and I think uh, like a seven-part series on, on, on proper coverage is, is kind of emblematic of that. I mean, it, it was uh, it, like if you if you if you put that together with like maybe when you like the certain some of the classes, for example, that were being offered mm. would be only offered in the men's side of the masala of a masjid that women are not allowed to be in. So sisters can't take that class. Mm. I'm not talking about the university. I'm talking right, about right. like because all university students, they're supposed to do uh, talaqi. They're meant to like, you know, oh. like go and find people that you learn also separately with. And that's how you really uh, get higher in scholarship. So I'd hear about, because I'm in, I, I was in the year of Azhar that I was the only girl, like from the Americans, right? So like Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans was in my year, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi, um, Sheikh Suhail Mullah, like all of these male, like American shiuch, yeah. they were, we were all in the same sort of year cohort. Do and you I was stay the, in that cohort throughout? No, I mean, I'm on the sister's campus. They're on the men's campus. No, no. What I mean is, do you all move together yes. a year by so it's yes. the same so it's, it's a long term yes. cohort okay yeah. so, so very probably strong relationships there but within Azhar, there's like various kuliyat like there's various like school like yes. right okay yes. so so they could be in different programs yes. but you're still part of the same cohort yes so, so your 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 particular area of focus is sharia my, mine was sharia my yeah. husband's was sharia sheikh suhail's was sharia almost everyone did sharia i think only sheikh yasser fahmi did dirasat islamia okay and um we just we yeah. like and it actually shows you how we perceive the study of religion is we focused on law, which is a very American thing to do, by the way. Very true. Um, so we... I, <laughs> curious, uh, comment a little about that when he says it's a very American oh, thing to do. It's so American Muslim, I think, even <laughs> should be more, yeah. Just to folk, yeah. hyper fixate on that instead of... Well, well, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 As a, okay, um, as a complete lay person, lawyer, whatever you want to call it, um, it, it the, the like Sharia or a focus on law becomes the end all be all and the solution to sort of the panacea mm -hmm. or the magic bullet that's going to fix and cure all as if our problems are not cultural as if our problems are not even let's say argue like let's say theological um or cultural but rather that law or fiqh or Sharia can sort of fix all of the problems that American Muslims are facing. Almost um, the obsession, every question yeah. like that is posed to, uh, to an imam is posed in the in the language Thank of you. law. And the yeah. problem is usually something so much deeper than that. Um, exactly. And so when we show up as young American Muslims to Egypt and we're like, we want to study Islam, 
we're uh, to us that means like what you do and what you don't do you know what i mean so and we understood there's a college of of, of aqidah and there's these other colleges yeah. and we're like but that's not really islam that's also like side subjects this is yeah. the real subject this is yeah. like the heart of it yeah and in reality they all play in together and hadith jibril really plays into that like you know, what are the five pillars of Islam? Where the what is Iman? What is Ihsan? And the you know signs of the hour. And you yeah. get like that four D concept of right. you know Islam is all of these things together. Like he came to teach you your Deen, mm -hmm. your religion. Your religion is your your do's and don'ts. It's what you believe. It's it's the the sort of like the spiritual practice yeah. and the spirit of what you practice. And it's also the context. That's what the signs right. of the hour really point to is the context. Right. And without you know, that is Dean. That together is Dean. But we we usually don't know how to situate any kind of mm -hmm. problem unless it's within the first part, which is like the do's and don'ts. That's right. That's right. And I think, I mean, and we don't need to get into this. This is like a side conversation. But um, I think there's an, like, especially coming out of the activist scene in yes. the late 90s or, you know, I know plus or minus a few years, the two of us, that is, mm -hmm. um, and Omar and, and Jamal and everyone. So like of that of that era, is um you know I, I I remember the words of like Sheikh um Thaha Jabir al Alwani, you know, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, you know, he used to say, like, you know, you go to the, the average Muslim conference, the obsession is hilal and halal. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like what's permissible and moon conversation sighting. around moon sighting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean Sheikh Qaradawi's book, and we've talked about him as well, Allah Yarham, like, you know, um and, and what a tr tremendous contribution it was to the discourse and, and to our like, I, I, I talked about it on the show. How it introduced me as a young man to what Islamic scholarship looked like, and yeah. but his book Al Halal Wal Haram for Islam, yeah. like again, also, like, that was the of sort of like that when he wrote about so true, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was like a formative, um, uh, you know, what's the word? Like text. Text. Yeah. Thank you. Text. <laughs> <laughs> a formative text for us. So we took that same mindset, or you know, you're saying the two of you did to your studies mm -hmm. as you went overseas yeah yeah so, so that was that that and i i witnessed in that that uh for for a sister to study was a lot harder than for a brother to study okay i'm um, glad you went there because i do want to talk about that yeah they they uh whether it's like circles that you're not just going to be invited to and even when my husband's invited to them and he asks well can my wife come and the answer is no the vast majority of the time i remember there was a particular teacher who was like yes she can come and i actually didn't go because I was just like, I'm so tired of hearing no, that it's like, I don't even want to be there. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it was just a very discouraging, like you're there trying to do it, but it's also, you're also very discouraged by um, what feels like you're getting shut out. Yeah. Because you're, uh, because just obviously because you're a woman. And, you know, add to it that the climate of sexual harassment, add to that the climate of like what's going on in Masajid and what the khutbas are about and people telling the sisters they should just cover their faces. And right. um, there was like one place that was like a really beautiful center that's actually an inspiration for the Majlis. But it just so happened that when I was finally able to go there, they shut down temporarily the section for ladies. Mm. Like I went there a few times and I really enjoyed it. And then after that, they just closed it off. And then when I came back to America, they reopened it for women. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but, uh, but I, I, I was able to actually separate between like I remember my good memories there, mm -hmm. and that place was a place of benefit for for me as a woman yeah. until it got closed down. And when they uh, and some like husbands and wives actually because they used to go and visit that particular center together, uh, they protested and they said, "Why can't my wife go?" And the person responded, the worker at that time responded it's better she she's muazaza mukarrama fi like right. let her be honored and dignified in her house so it was a very much like don't participate yeah. don't come don't be part of this so um anytime we would we would uh, advocate for something that is a normative right yeah. for muslim women we'd get labeled feminists mm. and i i took great offense to that because uh, i have never associated myself with feminism in any way i don't belong to the movement i don't I just, I just don't see myself in it. That hasn't been what has inspired me as a woman um, to do what I do. It's not part of my story in, in, in a formal way. So I don't like getting receiving a label because I'm actually just advocating right. what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so you know, came with a long time ago. But it's like easy to dismiss what you don't want to do for women with like a label, yeah, you know. Right. And I think we do that as a community. If someone asks a question about, well, what about this? They're like, oh, you're just a Sufi. What about this? Oh, mm -hmm. you're just a this. Oh, right. Like a label. No, I don't. I don't want. It's those labels mean I don't want to answer the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good point. Good point. Good point. Um, so, but what? How is it like at Azhar formally though for a female student? 
the faculty is all female? Uh, there's male and female faculty. Okay. So, uh, and so your teachers are both, are both male and female. Okay. Both yeah. male and female. Yeah. Um, and but your classmates. Classmates are all women. All women. Yeah. And, and from all around the world. So I was just about to ask. Is, yeah. That part of it's really beautiful. Okay. So the classmates. Were you the only Westerner in your cohort? I, I was the only American. American. Okay. In, in my yeah. year. Yeah. But uh, but there were definitely, there were sisters from France and there were sisters from, there's I remember there's a sister being from England. There were, there's a sister from Mexico. There was uh, obviously the a huge Malaysian contingency. They have their <laughs> own, like, uh, what is it called? Letterman jackets. <laughs> that say Al-Asa University. That's how you know the Malaysians because they made jackets that say Al-Asa University on them. That's so cool. Um, and then, yeah, from all over. From, yeah. And uh, there are some sisters from, I want to say, Kazakhstan or I think maybe Tajikistan. It's interesting because we share a language in common, like Farsi, so we, c- we could actually yeah. communicate outside of Arabic. Right. Um, but uh, the, it was the first time I met someone named Muslima. That was not me. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. And she was from Tajikistan. I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> Our mom's had a similar, you know. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, but that was actually the the experience with the sisters it was. was a beautiful experience. Mm-hmm. Oh, and there's Libyan sisters, other Arab countries as well, and uh, they they uh, many times were all living together. So, mm-hmm. in in a, you know bigger apartments that housed a lot of sisters together. So sometimes when it would be time for exams or finals, we'd go to to one home and like study together and mm-hmm. um, with international female students. And uh, just it was it was a really nice time. I mean, the actual studying was a, was I enjoyed. Alhamdulillah. Now I know, like for example, the, the the male faculty and graduates of Al Azhar they have a particular dress code that yes. that, that, that that's that, that's like you know not a uniform but it's like an honor yes. honorific dress code that the sheikh or the teacher is this similar for the female uh, no teachers? and so I actually asked right before I left there was like a women's conference right. at, at on the women's campus and I asked like the women's dean. Like I know the shiuch, they get this traditional clothing, and it's and it and it it, it really dates back to uh, many centuries. You know, like they, they this all has historical significance. For sure. Um, what about the women? Like, can we can we like come up with something that is for the sisters as like a mark of the fact that we've also gone through the same educational process? And um, remember the lady, she just looks at me and she goes, "Alhamdulillah, Allah honored us with hijab fourteen hundred years ago." <laughs> It's just like that is not the answer to my question, but that's okay. But um, so there's yeah. a lot of that, by the way, that happens. Is some, there's this, and I and I understand for an Egyptian to receive that question from an American is like, why are you coming here trying to impose mm. something on me? Yeah, and and um, or sort of like find a shortcoming in something that is really author- like authoritative in the Muslim world, but you want to yeah. inject it with something from your uh, paradigm. Uh, but I was like, well, the Malaysian students are wearing jackets, you know, <laughs> that have Letterman <laughs> jackets. Right. With like a... they, had, they, they got creative <laughs> yeah. about it. Um, now, as far as you know, um, from its very inception, uh, Al-Azhar has always allowed and, and, ha- and ha- has had a space and a track for female students. No, oh, actually, okay. it, it, it was originally only a, a place for male students. Mm. And then it was actually after, it was after uh, the French came into the country. Then the wait, they, so Napoleon, yes, like 1799 literally after <laughs> Napoleon came, it wow. had, uh, developed a women's campus. I, okay, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So, through the Fatimids and all of that, it was no. oh, oh, fascinating. Okay, um, but again, you're somewhat but, shameful. Well, we have to admit it, okay, it is somewhat thank shameful. Thank you. I was gonna let you go there, but yeah, um, but in terms of the text and, and the curriculum, it's, it's the same, meaning in terms of yeah, what, what actual, your male students yes, are, yeah, it's the same subjects, yeah. um, the texts are. The classical texts are going to be the same text. There's mm-hmm. some there's books that are like a lot of the professors write the books uh, that are sort of contextualized for the student. And so, for example, if you're doing Hanifi Fiqh, you're going to do the Hidayah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like maybe the teacher is going to do as a sort of a commentary on something within that. They're, they're going to write their own text. Oh. And so uh, the professors will sometimes yeah. do that. And um one thing I did notice, again, I could do this because my husband was in the men's college and I was in the women's college. We were both in Hanafi Fiqh, is I would compare our exams. And mm. I'm going to say this on your podcast, the women's exams were harder. <laughs> okay. They were harder. And I asked, I, specific, yeah. I, I end up asking him, like, why? I'm like, I looked at my husband's exam and I'm like, this is not fair. <laughs> this is not fair. Because the whole, your whole grade is count is based on like three questions. Right. Uh, you have like hundreds of pages of reading to like you basically almost memorize and then your whole grade for the year or for the class is going to be based on these three very detailed questions but 
uh, it could come from all of them can, can come from the beginning of the book okay. or the or can come from one of your th three or four books that you might have for that subject and mm. not the others or it could be spread out so you don't know where it's coming from you have to know it all very well so all the subjects are like that all the like subjects three are like that, and, yeah. And so, for example, you, you mentioned Hanafi folks. I'm curious. So, so you, you know, you've got the Hidayah, maybe one of the Muqtasar or something, right? Um, then is the exam like a like a law school pattern? I'm just curious. Like, is it like facts and then how you would apply Sharia to the facts? Or I'm just, you it's, mentioned. It's, 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 it's at this point in undergrad, it's copy and paste. They're not giving you anything new. They're only, um, it's, it's, can you bring this back from the text? Can you recall it? Can you do it verbatim? Well, so rote memorization was the way to go. memorization is, but except for Islamic economics, the teacher said, I will only grade you on understanding. And I think that was important because some of the students didn't have a bank account. They didn't know what a credit card was. Like they're coming from different economic and so you know yeah. backgrounds yeah. so that was actually a very hard exam for anyone that was not an american and anyone who's an american did really well mm. uh, in islamic economics because we knew all the terms and we just understood what was being discussed for a lot of the students they didn't know what was happening so um and, and you're able to uh, choose a particular madahib of focus mm. yes yeah. is that required yes okay. so so the you study fiqh muqarin which is like the comparative fiqh mm -hmm. But then you also specialize in one school. So as you're doing comparative fiqh, you are also taking in more detail the usul of your particular madhab as well as your particular madhab. Um, but that's the, the, in tandem with taking those same subjects in a comparative manner, which is, is really hard. By the way, this, you, you do this, but <laughs> if you were to ask me today, do I remember? No, I don't remember. That was too much. Like I remembered it enough for the exam and then I would die. Mm. So is, <laughs> what the, I do, <laughs> is the selection of the malhab, does it correlate to like real world demographics? Like are all the, the, the Indo, Indo Pakistanis? Well, like, yeah, is yeah. the Hanafi school like the most populated? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and and are like all the this no, he's picking the Hanafi and so oh, on and so yeah. forth. Right? Actually, I, I would say the Shafi school was more populated than the Hanafi okay. school because of local. Just, maybe because of local. Because of local, the population? local population, and uh, yeah. people are not going to like that I say this, but I think the Shafi method is a little bit easier to learn. <laughs> so the Hanafis are the method of the hypotheticals and what yes. if this happens and what if that happens and they come up with all sorts of things and so it's not yeah. it's a little bit more you know involved. I'm not trying to paint. All, you know the chef method in any kind of negative brush. No, no. It's just, right. I, I studied also the chef method at some level with uh -huh. someone, and I was just like, this is a lot more simple than my Hanafi yeah. book. I could really nerd out, but we should probably yeah. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So I, we should have said this at the outset. So we're we're, we're recording on this crazy <laughs> t schedule and, t and time crunch. So um, this is meant to be kind of a truncated uh, highlights uh, episode. Inshallah, we'll have um, you know um, Sheikha Muslima back on to. You know, give us some more, you know, detailed uh, episode later. But I guess yeah. we'll start moving the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think where we want to because I could get literally to... spend <laughs> yeah. probably an hour talking to you about your Hanafi curriculum <laughs> or, or or the Ezra experience as in general. <laughs> right? Sure, sure. I mean, I just meant on a personal yeah. geek level. So Sorry. we want to obviously get to the majlis. Yeah. The yeah. question I have before that mm -hmm. is, you come back as a proper scholar, mashallah. But there's no, it's not like there's a million jobs in America waiting for people mm -hmm. who have graduated from. So I'm curious just yeah. what that experience is to graduate with like a proper scholarship. Like mm -hmm. it's a legitimate, uh, it's yeah. like, it's not like going, graduating with an engineering degree from Stanford and then, you know, you know all these tech companies are giving you offers left and right. So mm -hmm. what is that, what is that experience? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because you say you graduate, you come back a quote unquote proper scholar. When I, when we were in Egypt, we this was not lost on us that an undergraduate degree from Al Azhar is the beginning of your studies, yeah. and so it just means you're a continuing student. So the the word scholar is very easily and I want to say it's loosely used in America. It mm -hmm. means, but when I think alim, I'm thinking you know mm -hmm. um, Sheikh Taha Rayyan, who is like a you know Allah yarhamu may Allah increase him and bless him. He was someone who really represented what is a scholar. You know, um, that, that was there in Egypt when we were there. Mm. Um, so there's like, I, I recognize that that term is used to, to, to mean certain things, but it doesn't translate well in Arabic mm. yeah. to the reality of what we saw there. And then also it's like there's there's different words that are used in different countries. So someone graduates a program in a certain part of the world and they say, oh, this person's an alima because she did four years. It's like alima is going to be a different meaning in Egypt. It doesn't, it doesn't actually, uh, it's not, sure. it doesn't correspond that way. For sure. Or mufti. Or I was just about to say, yeah. we have, 
you know, mufti schools, you know, if da programs in the in the subcontinent that have an entirely different meaning yeah. in the in the in yeah. the in in Egypt, for example. Yes. Yeah. So, for, so for example, even like the, and it does kind of go back to curriculum. Like each person is referring to a different thing. So, someone yeah. who does if da according to the Hanafi school, I don't know. Like in terms of like, I know Dar al Ifta exists in Egypt as a as an additional institution that will train an Azhari student into the practice of being able to give a formal fatwa. And even though they do specialize in a school, they actually start to learn about how to apply this across schools and learn about other schools as well. And I know that like for the ones that you're talking about, it's within the method. And I know That's that right. exists. Right. So, but but the terms are not used. I want to say like terms mean different things in different contexts. Yeah. So when you say come back to America, um. I want to say, like, I felt when I came back, I'm a sister who went overseas and studied. It. <laughs> and that's it. But so, when I came back in terms of work, there was no role in the community, in the field of just teaching. I had to take on an organizational role. So my first role, position when I came back was actually to be an executive director for a Muslim organization. But I told them, I said, like, I know that's what you have as a job offering, but I really want to also teach. And so they changed the title to education and executive director. And then I was allowed to teach some classes. Um and then I transitioned out of that. Uh, my hus- I became a mother, actually. And then my husband also was an imam at the masjid, which is very different. A man graduates, comes back, and there's already... There's a lot of there was a lot of positions in SoCal. He could have, mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, there were people like interviewing him. It was much more like what you describe about coming out of the tech industry. Yeah, I, right. I, I was going to say there's like a track. Yeah, yeah. For... I do. Just as a side note, I I was living in uh, Irvine mm-hmm. in um, late 2011, early 2012, and I do mm-hmm. remember seeing him and saying, "Hey, it's, I'm enjoying this this, uh, this <laughs> these footballs." So mm-hmm. just as a side note. Alhamdulillah. And so he was, he was an imam for a number of years. And then uh, we actually started to be chaplains for IOK, uh, like yeah. chaplains at university campuses. So he left his position as an imam after three years. And we did chaplaincy with IOK, Alhamdulillah, UCI, UCLA, and USC. And that was actually a very beautiful experience. But we were kind of all over, literally all over the place. I don't know if you, you anyone who knows SoCal knows like being at three campuses <laughs> yep. is a lot of work. That's right. And it, stre- it, it stretched us as a family very thin. And so uh, finally, we, we, you know, all of these things kind of contributed to different experiences. Yeah. Um, and uh, we wanted to build a space that could kind of bring together the best of what we had experienced and and also learn from the worst of what we had experienced in the Muslim community. And I remember when it, like for me, one of my inspirations when we were starting to form the Majlis was visiting Tatli for the first time. Here in Fremont? Here in the the Bay Area, yeah. So I, I walked in and it was such a palpably different experience that it changed me. And part of it, too, was that I remember when I was in Egypt, I saw videos of Ta'lif. Ta'lif like, had put out some promotional mm-hmm. material online, YouTube videos. And as someone who had been in the Muslim community, I, I, I just felt like marketing videos are usually so much better than what they advertise. <laughs> so, um, so I was like, let me go see. Let me just go see what it's like. Yeah. And I wasn't looking for like a religious experience. I wasn't look. I was, I was like, let me just like see what it's like. And, yeah. and so I walk in and it was such a beautiful it was a religious experience. It was like a, I walk into a room and a bona fide religious experience. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. I actually feel like it, there was the, the love that people had for each other. And I'm walking in as a person who is, you know, not known in that room. Like I was walked in as a stranger. Uh, and the, the way that I felt like every single person, no matter what their background or practice was, was like welcome there, accepted there. And that they had connection to each other. Mm-hmm. It's not just that you are welcome here as an individual, but all the individuals here have sort of silently made a contract that we are here together doing this, you know? Beautiful. So the sister in the corner who's like, like I said, she like looks like she's just walked in from like a very fancy wedding yeah. <laughs> and a brother over there who has tattoos and whatnot. And then you have another lady who's like covering her face. Literally, there was someone that was like that there. But there's like so much love between them. Yeah. And like from from coming from all different backgrounds and different ethnicities. And the yeah. other thing that I always noticed about Tatlif was different ages. Different ages, like yeah, different had, generations. You had yeah. like literally our parents' generations. So yeah. It wasn't just a cool place for young people. No, no. You had, right? Yeah. yeah. Perez can speak to that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. Uh, I'm just reflecting I, on so much. Um, when, I, I, uh, when I walk in, I describe it as I felt like the air hugged me. <laughs> like I was like, what is going on? Why, is, why, am I, why am I feeling like this here? And so you, you know? then... Go back and you want to do something that brings that same spirit in, in San Diego or yeah, Orange County. Yeah. But so, I mean, I, I no, just because like I was saying, I'm just reflecting on or, or sitting with so much while you shared your experiences about Jalif. Because I think there's there's also something to be said of for our generation who, again, came of age in the Muslim community in the 90s, 
where feeling at home in, in community settings as much as we wanted to, because mm -hmm. we are, you know, we're not talking about people who are detached from the mosque or unmasked or whatever that whatever the term is. You, you know, we grew up in the masajid, and yeah. yet, as much as we longed for a space that welcomed us and that we felt at home, uh, there was always something lacking. And mm -hmm. so, I think when that leaf comes about in a context like that, it just seems like a. I mean, a breath of fresh fresh air would be yeah. underselling it. Yeah. Would be really underselling it. It's like you, it, it, you know, it's interesting because there's like a there's like a sense of connection that the people feel with each other. But there's also this deep sense of connection that you have. I want to say with yourself, like you, like you're rooted in something. Um, you belong, even though you don't know anyone there, but you automatically have that sense of belonging. And um, it's like the 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 dissonance that you've been carrying for a long time around different things. It's like I don't have to carry it anymore because there's a place that figured it out. It's one identity. Like you don't mm. have to be a different person when you're coming into a Muslim space. You don't have to change the way you talk or the way you act or the way you sit. As you go and try to, again, bring that same thing to Southern California, did, did you did you figure out what the magic ingredient was? <laughs> could, could, is there something that you could actually put in words? I mean, so I want to say that Talif was one of, it was a major for me sure. and, and inspiration, but it was also the one of the places that was an inspiration was the Maldifa in Egypt. And the Maldifa is like a guest, it, was, it literally means like a guest house. And it brought these eminent scholars to come and teach, but it would in it was in a setting where the students were being served. They were being served tea and uh, some crackers or, or, or biscuits or cookies and whatnot. And um, there was like this idea of you honor the people that are coming to learn. Mm -hmm. And in it was just a, like that was a very beautiful thing to experience, and uh, especially in the Muslim world. <laughs> and uh, I guess that Talif does something very similar to that. But it was really there's, that this is actually something that connects it. So what Talif is doing in America in this particular context in the Bay Area yeah. is rooted in a traditional sort of um, reality or understanding. And I would say that it's uh, like for the Majlis, we say that in terms of our mission, it's to it's a place that's meant to create a safe space for people to learn about Islam. Like, and but from a traditional a, a traditional understanding of Islam, but also contextualized for the American yeah. landscape, and uh, it emphasizes things like spiritual refinement and love and service. So yeah. those are like the four things that we kind of felt were foundational. Like we we, we need to be a learning community. We need to be one that uh, studies at the feet of scholars, you know, but also honors the students who come. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 on, and then like this idea of coming as you are, like the American context, you don't have to change yourself to be here. Just come just the way you are and you're accepted. You the, know, other, the other thing, well, I know just the, la the other thing on. I'll throw in there is you, all those ingredients, don't, the only thing that comes to mind that um, maybe wasn't mentioned is just the mm -hmm. Asan doing things in a beautiful way. Yes. Right? Because you, you went, well, it would smell good. It would yeah. be, uh, so just, it was welcoming was to my me experience. as a woman. I mean, I, I remember my very first visit, um, I was invited to come and address the community from the front of the room for for me just just visiting you know like i and i kept saying no i'm just here to visit i just want to sit here and benefit and they were like no 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 you've studied overseas and mm. you should come in uh, like please just give us some nasiha and make da'a and i had i, I want to say that that was also just a realization that not everyone believes that women shouldn't be teaching them and mm -hmm. not everyone in the muslim community has a misogynistic outlook or not everyone doesn't want women to be in a place of education there's some people who actually will yeah. elevate you and elevate your voice because they really value that background no the only thing i wanted to add is i mean we'd be remiss if we didn't mention because i know i mean as far as like trajectory goes yeah. that leaf comes from Zaytuna Institute, mm -hmm. Zaytuna Institute of the late 90s early 2000s and only one of the three of us sitting in this room and that's i'm looking at omar right now um, had the pleasure of attending Zaytuna Institute. Mm -hmm. This is before the college. So I wanted you just to opine on having seen both spaces, kind of talking about what, you know, Sheikh Muslim is talking about. Like, that was taught and institutionalized at Zaytuna Institute. Am I am I right in saying that? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a kind of impromptu answer, but yeah, I mean, I, anytime I went to Zaytuna Institute, six thirty one Jackson, and I and I still have good feelings when I drive down yeah. Jackson Street, even though it's not a very nice area. No, I just feel like I was welcome. Everybody is welcome. Everybody wants to be there. You're gonna just be. You're gonna learn something amazing, something new. But that's also rooted in something beautiful and true, and, and that's Islam. And it's going to change. You may, you know, for me, not being, a, you know, not being a scholar in any sort of way, I, I still walked away with seeing the world maybe in a different way. Even though I didn't, ha I wasn't necessarily walking with like 
a lot of knowledge that I would go teach others. But I, I had a bit of a, a lens that I was seeing the world with mm-hmm. that was, uh, inshallah, like more more prophetic in a way, right? More in that in that uh, spirit, not just so looking at okay, hey, I I went there and now I'm now I'm coming out and I'm seeing the. Mm-hmm. It's just that's that's what I mean by the ihsan, the beauty yeah. that right. you're kind of soaking in. Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting because, you know, this the spiritual emphasis is does play out in uh, very subtle ways. Like when you're saying that you come out and you see the world completely differently, it's not that other centers didn't invite women. It's not that I did, I spoke. I was on stages before I went to go study overseas. Like I was like because of MSA involvement right. and things of that nature, right. but. I just, there's something that women pick up on and it's when you're being spoken to in a tone that is very condescending. Mm -hmm. And so it's not even in the words that a person is saying, but it's literally in their tone of voice. And you're like, okay, I know where you stand, Mm -hmm. you know? And so you walk into a space and you're like, I don't even hear that tone of voice here. Mm. And um, when I'm being asked, it's not a photo op, (laughs) you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's not something that is sort of tokenized. I was just about to say, Um, like two, two words come to mind again, paternalism, but also tokenism and, and having experienced that, I mean, I can only imagine. So, and it, and just to close um, on that, it it goes back to, you were talking about uh, like um, everything being focused on fiqh. Mm. I think the places we've mentioned, they did teach fiqh. It was was actually big, Mm. but there was also rahma, right? Exactly. And all these the things, love the and law. rahma. What is the law without its spirit? Thank and, you. And, Thank you. Yeah. and like, I think it was going overseas that helped us to actually realize who our scholars are in America, yeah. who our real scholars are, because when we went to Egypt and studied, first off, it really it dismantled a lot of sort of extreme thinking for in terms of what that we had extreme tendencies because we just didn't know the way the law worked. And right. we were so inflexible. Right. Uh, and then we realized, wow, there's pluralism in fiqh. There's pluralism even in aqidah. There's three madhahib in aqidah. There's there's four madhahib. In, and then even within the madhahib, there's differences of opinion. And then there's ifta from different schools. And then you have um, in tasawwuf, right? And this idea of ihsan, we had always, unfortunately, had a misunderstanding that the spiritual dimension of the religion um, that people who over quote what was called overemphasizing it, that they were just basically like uh, people who like to stand next to tyrants. You know, like it's a it's an excuse to it's like uh, pacifism. Social justice pacifism comes from those who emphasize the spiritual because it's the opium of the masses. You know, <laughs> it's a very and and uh, so wherever you find a scholar who emphasizes spirituality, you find him standing next to a tyrant. And mm. so there was this kind of like uh, that that can't possibly be Islam. And it's like, well, you know, there's just like there's pluralism in fiqh and there's pluralism in aqidah, there is pluralism in tasawwuf. And there's yeah. many different spiritual paths. And some of the paths have people who are very firm in, in social justice and um, and they're, they're in, and very soft with the people, but very firm with the rulers. Yeah. And others who actually were, their role was, we're going to try to limit the oppression of the ruler. So um, it was to protect the people in that way. And it was, it's not a popular place for anyone to be. And you can say, that's not my position, but it's not the only position. And there's a, it was kind of painted that way in America, yeah. that this is the only way that a person can be uh, you know spiritual. And it's, no, we have, there's many paths and they're, it's rooted in our tradition. To not have a spiritual path is actually a modern <laughs> 20th, 20th century thing like if that was a that was another part of the re, sort of discovering the tradition which was how did we not know all of this was part of like the tradition that has existed for over a thousand years hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years this has been being practiced every whether it's Bukhari or Imam mm-hmm. Nawi or you know all the scholars that everyone wants to quote for other in other contexts for their outward knowledge they were also scholars of inward knowledge yeah and that spiritual path it's you can, to ignore it is to ignore the the you know the essence of the religion itself. There's a lot can be said about that, but I think there's like I mean if I could offer like a thesis as I've contemplated the exact very issue that you have or that that you bring up, which is that I think what happened in the Muslim community in the United States was you had a melting pot of people coming from different backgrounds, different nationalities, certainly different cultural practices, and so on. And when they came to the Amer- when when they came to the United States, much like the spirit of America, which is, you know, um, the melting pot and to assimilate, yeah. we sort of assimilated our Islam and it became this uh, mono, like there, there's a beauty in black and there's a beauty in white uh, that that isn't captured in the dullness of gray, if I yeah. could borrow that yes. kind of analogy. Yes. <laughs> so th- there's a beauty in being able to maintain that diversity and, and uniqueness. And I think what happened with the melting pot 
of America and and, and w- which kind of seeped its way into the the way Muslims framed our communities here was we kind of became this amalgamation, this melting pot, and those unique flavors were sort of dissolved. Um, and I but and at the same time, there was an influx of money coming from particular parts of the Muslim world that shall be uh, not you know that shall not be named, um, where that that was that were promoting a very specific ideology, which in its which very kind of this again dull monochromatic kind of ideology. Well, anytime, and, anytime, like one school of thought is uh, becomes underst- understood as the only school of thought. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a hegemonic. <laughs> you use the word hegemony. That, that that's what that's where it that's, gets used. That's right. It's to the extent that nobody even knows they're following it because that's that's the only thing that's available in English. So, so it's just the default understanding of Islam. And then you go and you're like, no, my religion. And actually, the, what my parents had been taught in Afghanistan when as Hanafis, and then they came to the masjid and people told them they were praying wrong, you know. Um, and so they had they felt like they had to erase this part of their history. No, it's actually they learned how to pray right. Exactly. Uh, we just didn't understand difference of opinion because we didn't. Our our knowledge of the religion was really shallow. So and, so beautifully said, and 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 that can be you know you, you like you gave an example of a Hanafi, but I like I gave the example like I, I give the example of like even you were talking about the spiritual essence, you know you you know communities back home where the burda was recited every Thursday, where every like a maulid was held once a month, and then they came to America, and again it was like they were taught that that was wrong and it was cultural and it was bid'ah and all, and all mm-hmm. of the usual stuff and unfortunately that didn't get passed on yeah. you know to the late like because it was seen as like you know it was more cultural perhaps and you know what's interesting about this is the answer to people who might feel this way it's a very simple answer it's like you just need to study more it's yeah. literally you just need to if, if you really go in and study you i don't need to convince you of anything the evidence speaks for itself we That's were right. not going to egypt so that we could be convinced of it we're just trying to study islam mm-hmm. and you cannot ignore what the tradition has to offer. It's overwhelming evidence. It's not, to turn away from it is very, like you have to be not wanting to see it because that's how evident, self-evident yeah. it is. The breadth, the scope, yes. the the plurality mm-hmm. of opinions and, and options that are available. Yeah. So I guess as we begin to conclude and uh, you know, we want to talk about the majlis. So I think there's also something very beautiful that can perhaps be said about what, when you, what, what you experienced in Egypt, you know, you mentioned like the guest house, for example, or like the idea of a third space, the idea that where people could come together in a communal setting that was not the masjid. Yes. That was not, you know, a place of ibadah or worship. Um, and that model of spaces or of a space had sort of been neglected, I think, for far too long. Mm-hmm. And what Talif just sought to do, Zaytuna before it, and then certainly Majlis, mm-hmm. was to sort of re, um, you know, reintroduce that into the American landscape. Would you agree with that kind of an assessment? Yeah, I mean, th- this idea that, like, someone of another faith or belief system should be able to walk in to a gathering and uh, feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. feel welcome, to feel like they can hang out, feel like they can listen to something if they want to. And because I have, my husband's a convert to Islam, I'm very sensitive to that. When he was an imam, I, and and he would bring my, you know, my mother-in-law, you know, I, I literally internally, I would be so nervous. Like, I hope no one says anything wrong to her. You know, I hope no one mistreats her. And this is a message that we're at, but like the, the, a message is not an intentional community. It's meant to be open to anyone from any walk of life with, you know, the Bedouin walked into the prophet's message and he urinated right there into the message. But do we want that to be the sort of the first thing someone sees when their intentional community, I think is really significant because it means everyone who is coming is coming with this idea that we're here to, love each other, to serve each other, to grow together, um, and to and to be accepting of the fact that everyone's journey is in a different place, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and what you shared about your mother-in-law, I mean, as, as both of us, me and Omar, father of two daughters each, I mean, you know, that's a fear that I have every time I bring my kids to the masjid. Mm-hmm. God, I hope someone doesn't say something or comment on their clothing or, we're, you know. We're like, constantly, Barbez and I, as, as um, again, fathers of daughters who are, close to each other and cousins as well. Um, we, we were constantly having that question, like, is this event going to be have a positive or a yeah, negative? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but just as we wrap up on time, is there anything you want to share about what's happening with the Majlis right now, the yeah. work happening today and, and going forward 
just you want to uh, share with our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Where can people find out more about the majlis? And again, listeners, I mean, you know, inshallah, we'll have Sheikh Muslim back on. Uh, inshallah, we'll come to you this time and, and, we'll, and we'll sit again. Um, but yeah, please do. Please share about a majlis and where people can maybe even connect remotely. People, you know, I'm sure it, during COVID you were doing things remotely entirely. But is there stuff that, where people can find you online and, and connect? Yeah, even so, if they're in Raleigh. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Full circle. I like Full that. Full circle. There you go. So, so the pandemic made it so that the Majlis had to go b become virtual. Yeah. And then when we came back in person, it re remained both in person and virtual. Okay. And so now, alhamdulillah, all the things that we were doing before the pandemic, like on site, and we didn't have recordings of them. They are now, everything we do has a recording. And uh, we also have like a private ladies study circle. And I do it on site in San Diego. But it's also virtual for any women who want to join in from around the world. And it's interesting, like we set up the, the, the programming for the Majlis where we have spaces that are shared, brothers and sisters together, and then we have some special women's only type things as well. The Something that's coming up in May is going to be, we're going to do our ladies conference again, and or ladies retreat. Mm. And we did, uh, we had around like 200 women last year when we did it. Uh, and it was, everyone asked, they said, you have to make this annual. So we're going to try to do that again, inshallah, bring female scholars. And um, when are you thinking, I'm sorry, my ears perked up because uh, yeah. my wife, my, my, yeah, my, my, my 20th, daughters. May 20th, 20th. First weekend, inshallah. Oh, inshallah. Okay, and, inshallah. and age would there be age appropriate? Maybe uh, tracks for like say younger kids or I, I think because this is a ladies retreat mm. and the idea is moms are going to be off duty oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Understood. So, thir Understood. so maybe 13 okay. anyone that is basically old enough to basically enjoy the program as a as a woman and the so that's one thing to look forward to yeah. but in terms of like our like we have two offices one in Irvine and it's at the New Horizon Community Center and another one in San Diego and that's it's at ICSD extension yeah. we have classes every Sunday in both San Diego and Irvine and it's like walk-in welcome, but it's also online. And uh, I teach tafsir on Tuesdays. Sheikh Fuad is currently teaching Sira um, on Wednesdays. We do a believing together kind of mode of gathering on every other Thursday. Also, other thir every other Thursday we do the ladies um, study circle. So there's a lot of different kinds of programs. You have a kids program as well, but that you have to be on site for. Yeah. All of that can be found on our website which is the us. Yeah. Um, I want to say the office hours is like I, one of the, one of the offerings that I'm the most uh, excited about because anyone around from around the world can call and set up their own half hour appointments with either myself or my husband or Sheikh Fuad or Chaplain Sundus. And it can be about anything like the half hour is yours. So yeah, thank you so much. Again, I, I cannot thank you enough. So listeners, thank you as always for listening. Uh, you know, again, from both Umar and myself, we thank uh, Sheikh Muslima. Fiyaman Allah, inshallah, safe travels and make, may Allah return back to our home, safe and sound to our family. Listeners, as always, thank you for listening. You can reach out to us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, etc. And uh, please, if you are interested in what we do and want to support us in any way, you can become a patron and go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence so thank you thank Sheikh Muslima for joining us um, and inshallah we will see you on the next episode of diffuse congruence